Hmm? Ah! Oh. We just wanted to find our friend. Friend? Yeah, friend. Will? What? Is friend? Is she serious? Um, a friend is someone, someone that you do anything for. You lend them your cool stuff like comic books and trading cards. And they never break a promise. Especially when they're spit. Spit? A spit swear means you never break your word. It's a bond. That's super important because friends, they tell each other things. Things that parents don't know. Hey everybody, I'm Rima. And I'm Sean. And this is Strange Indeed, a podcast dedicated to the show Stranger Things. Today we will be covering the second episode from season one titled Chapter Two, The Weirdo on Maple Street. Yes, so let's go ahead and jump into our top five from episode two. So, Sean, you were kind enough to let the lady go first last time. I'm going to hand it over to you this week, and uh, let's let's hear your uh, number five. All right, so I want to start off with the title of the episode uh, because, you know, this is a very 80s nostalgia uh, TV series, you know, and, like, the scary movies were a big influence on this. And mm-hmm. I'm not sure if this is where they got it from, but I kind of have to feel like they did. So the weirdo on Maple Street sounded very, very similar to me to a great 80s horror flick titled Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. So I didn't really catch any references to the the Nightmare on Elm Street in the show, except the actually I didn't catch anything at all. But I kind of like, you know, we've talked about it before with the, you know, choose your own adventure t- style uh, title card. Uh, this was just another cool thing that they can kind of throw in and say, hey, you know, because I, I think it was in the, the news last week where they said they're they're kind of, you know, giving ode to the, the decade they were born. And Nightmare on Elm Street, if you loved horror movies, like that was probably one of the first horror movies that's kept me up every night because you couldn't go to mm-hmm. sleep. You can't hide yeah. anywhere. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I love Nightmare on Elm Street, the original, like, because back in the day, I mean, it got done so, so much that it was like, you know, just overdone. Um, And it kind of, I think, saturated, you know, everybody with Freddy Krueger and stuff. But the original, man, back in the day when you were a kid and watched that, yeah, that was great. Yeah, I know uh, one of the, this is kind of a side tangent on that, but one of the the ideas I really enjoyed about Nightmare on Elm Street was um, the very ending. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's basically that, uh, actually, Nancy, that was her name in Nightmare on Elm Street, I believe. Yep. Um, she was, so the, the, the theory I've heard is that when she wakes up and thinks she's safe and she gets rid of Freddy Krueger, that she had actually just basically woken up into another dream. Mm-hmm. So it was another dream inside of a dream, so it was Freddy messing with her even more. Because you see your mom get pulled through the window. Yeah. But uh, my number five, again, is just kind of a nice little ode to the 80s with this kind of similar title of, the weirdo on Maple Street sounding very, very similar to a nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, that's, yeah, good, good comparison. I totally agree. Um, that was really good. Yeah, I, I have to agree. That's something I, I kind of go into a little bit later in my list is is some of the references and stuff that we see in the 80s. And I'll circle back around to that a little bit. I won't talk it out too much because I think you covered that piece of it pretty good. But but yeah, this this show is so good. You, there's so many things to dissect and things that you can, you know, watching it a couple times that you really pick up on. So that was really good. I hadn't thought about that part. Awesome. Anything else on your number five? Nope. That's a, it's a kind of a short and sweet one, but it's kind of like that ode back to the 80s nostalgia. Oh, I love the 80s. Okay, cool. So my number five um, is just kind of in general throughout this episode where we see compassion um, being shown to others and from various characters. And I I just thought it was really kind of sweet how like um Mike initially had compassion for 11 cuz you know you know they found 11. We didn't touch too much on 11 um in the previous podcast that we did from season uh or from episode 1 in this season, you know when when 11 was discovered. Uh we talked about it a little bit but not too much. So, you know, Mike found 11. It's raining, it's storming, you know, as they're out there looking for Will. He takes her home. He was so nice to her. You know, the, the the other two boys, Dustin and Lucas, are, you know, kind of teasing a little bit, like, you know, calling her mental, thinking she escaped from, you know, some sort of local mental institute or whatever. Like, yeah, they called it like Penthurst, which 
I'm, yeah. I don't know if that comes into play anymore, but they said it like multiple times. Like, is she from Penthurst? You know, yeah. do you have family at Penthurst? Exactly. So, you know, they're kind of you know, like freaking out, like, you know, we got to tell our parents and, and, you know, they're, they're freaking out because he gives her some clothes and she tries to like, like undress herself right there in front of them <laughs> boys. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And they start freaking out, which was so adorable. Those boys are so cute in their reaction. Um, but, you know, he just, he gives her some dry clothes, takes her to the bathroom so she can have some privacy gives her a nice place to sleep and the way he just talks to her you can like really hear the kindness and compassion come out um in his character and i just thought that was really sweet um you know how he was trying to explain things to her um and it and it she could see that and it started to like open her up where she would even start to like speak a few words because she wasn't talking at all um so mike showing kindness to 11 i thought was really nice um also nancy um, when they were at the high school and they see Jonathan Will's brother, he's putting mm, up that missing yeah. poster of his brother. And, you know, she's kind of hanging with the cool crowd right now, you know, and they're kind of, you know, teasing him and kind of making fun of him and stuff like the cool crowd always did to the, you know, the oddballs in the school. And, you know, she just kind of gives him a look and she decides to go over and, you know, like, hey, I'm so sorry, you know, about what's going on. I'm sure he's fine. You know, she's trying to be encouraging. I thought that was really sweet. Um, and you should just see both Nancy and Mike doing what's right, but besides, you know, despite like being made fun of by their peers. Um, so I like, I like whenever you see someone doing right and kind of going against the crowd and not trying to be cool because I don't know, that's something that I've always kind of, I guess I, I just kind of attached to that a little bit because that's something that kind of remind me of me just a little bit. So I always like to do my own thing. I didn't like to be cool for cool's sake. If I liked something, I liked it and not because someone told me to. And then one last moment was like between Jonathan and Will during the flashback, whenever they were in Jonathan's room and they were listening to the music and um, Will was telling, or he was telling Will not to do something because someone else tells you to. Um, and I just thought that was really sweet, you know, telling him to be his own person. And it, it was a sweet, you know, sibling moment. So that was my number five, it was just all the sweet moments of compassion shown to other characters um, from other characters on the show. Yeah, I think you, you typically see that in some shows but I, I agree with you that this was more well done. Like the whole brother scene, like typically it seems like whenever you see it in other shows, they, they're already kind of talking about it and it's like a forced conversation. Mm -hmm. But with this, you know, he's, he's trying to distract his brother with the, the music, be like, hey, you really like this music, right? Okay, you know, this is, you can have this tape. And you're not really, you don't know why they're listening to it. It's just like maybe it's two brothers hanging out. Yeah. But then you hear the mom on the phone and, you know, the younger brother, his ears perk up a little bit. Will's kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, he's not going to come, is he? And that's when he kind of gives a speech, which, um, you know, great compassion moment. And then with Nancy kind of, you know, going to him later and showing him that compassion. Um, it's always interesting that because at that age, you're you're really like, OK, I don't want to go against the grain. Like, I don't want to rock the boat. Right. And with Nancy going over there and talking to the, you know, the uncool kid, you know, the poor kid from down the street, you know, the the group even mentioned the the jokester of the group. I guess he probably would be was saying like, "Oh, I bet he was the one that killed him." Yeah, right. You know, which is horrible to think about. But you know, <sighs> the, I think every school has that kid. Like, there's a girl in my high school who everybody made fun of. Like, she was kind of annoying and odd. But it's like, just there's no reason to be a jerk to her. I mean, it's just you know, right. if you don't like her, don't talk to her. Don't be a jerk. I know. I hate. I hated that part of school. <laughs> Yeah. Didn't didn't like that mean crowd, you know? Yeah. Yep. So that was my number five. I just liked all those sweet moments of compassion. I thought it was just really nice. Okay. Uh so my number four, I think I'll, I'll tie into it a little bit. More so it's it's basically the intro to eleven. So it's there's the whole compassion part of it too, but I think the interaction when they all show up, it's the three boys and she's sitting on there. And they're trying to figure out, you know, it's like, you know, maybe she's death. And I'm terrible with names. What was his name? Um the kid that wears the ball cap. Dustin. Dustin. Dustin goes on. He's like, well, maybe she's deaf. And he claps and she jumps. He's like, <laughs> yeah. okay, well, maybe she's not deaf. <laughs> but, I mean, like, these boys are, what, like 10 or 11? And so girls are very foreign to boys at this age. Like, you don't know what girls are, like, all about. You just know they're, you know, they, they're on the other side of the classroom. Mm -hmm. They laugh at you and make fun of you as boys. And they always, you know, like, punch you then run back to their friends. <laughs> yeah. And so, like, they're giving him clothes, and then she's like, like you said she, earlier, she tries to, you know, just undress right there in front of him. They're all like, oh, my God, no, 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 I, no, God, <laughs> yep. no. <laughs> and Dustin, I love how, like, this whole episode still, Dustin keeps obsessing with the fact that she tried to get naked, <laughs> yeah. like, multiple times at the, in the basement, then at school the next day. Yep. And then as they're talking about it, he's like, do you think, do you think those two slept naked? 
to his buddy. Like that's a total like twelve year old thing you would ask. Like they wouldn't do that, right? Like sleep naked. Yeah, it's hilarious how he keeps gesturing. Like he won't even say it. He'll just like gesture like she was trying to take her shirt off, and in front of him he's just like, oh, you know, can, can you believe that? You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's hilarious. Yeah, it's that's that's awesome. Yeah, you're right. That that whole interaction with them was was really great. How they were just so I w not over the top, but just exactly how you would picture boys of that age. If a, if a girl, you know, if she doesn't know, you know, obviously she's, you know, there's something different about her. We don't know what yet, but, um, you know, just just obviously she doesn't have that modesty. And when they they're like, no, 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 and they turn around <laughs> like they just don't even. You know, because they're not at that age yet. They're not girl crazy yet. You know, they're like girls are, like you said, weird and foreign and they haven't quite got them figured out yet, which I don't know. You guys probably never do really figure oh, this out, no. but you, no, at least don't you don't have a clue. So, no. <laughs> but I mean, it's like it's even more interesting because it's like the 80s. So, like today's age with the Internet and stuff like kids probably know way more than they need to. Mm -hmm. But like these kids, like it's the eighties, they have like, they know nothing about girls. Like, I don't even know if you have health class yet to explain that, like what puberty is to these guys. So they're just completely, you know, this is almost like an alien. Like girls aren't allowed in the basement with boys in this time frame. And here they are breaking this big rule. Yeah. Like, like, cause they were like, you're going to let her sleep here? Like a girl? Really? <laughs> a girl? Um, it's hilarious. Yeah. They probably haven't even gotten to the age yet where they've discovered their dad's playboys or anything yet. So yeah, I guess that would have been the point. Yeah. Or I guess would have been the, uh, the time frame is that you sneak in there and be like, Oh, we're going to find the bottle rockets that day. What are these? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh <don't> even... <laughs> no. Yeah. I don't think they're even there yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, but yeah, my, my number four is just kind of that intro to, to L oh, I guess it's a little bit further where he gives her her nickname. Mm -hmm. um, but just getting these boys to introduce to her and um, Dustin freaking out about the fact she's trying to get naked the whole time. Yeah, it's so genuine. Um, you, you you really feel it. These these boys are such great actors that whether or not he was truly repulsed, whether how much of that was acting versus like would you know would he really react that way in real life? You know, it was just it was um, really good. Was, those boys are knocking it out. Awesome. So my number four is also about eleven. Um, kind of a little bit to, to just broaden a little bit about her. Like, I felt so, like, we get introduced to her in, you know, the first episode, and she's just, like, scared out of her mind. You know, she's at Benny's, and she's, like, obviously hungry because she's, like, stealing fries, and, you know, she's got these people after her, <clears throat> and we see her, you know, at Mike's, and she, I mean, she just looks so scared. She's, like, dripping wet, and these wet, and, you know, had, had wet clothes on, and she's shaking. She's, you can see her, like, cowering in fear as, as the boys are kind of sitting there, like, arguing back and forth, and there's this thunder and lightning going on, and you can see she's kind of flinching. So there's obviously something wrong with her, um, or something has happened to her. You can see, you know, she's had some sort of traumatic experience, and, you know, she gets scared about being locked in the closet, and you see some sort of flashback, you know, to that, some yeah. type of facility where she was being held and those men dragging her to that tiny little room. And the whole time she's like screaming and crying. And gosh, I mean, you really felt it. I mean, she, Millie Bobby Brown, she just, she does so great as Eleven. I mean, it almost made me cry. Like how, you know, how real that was for her and, and how well that she played that. And I mean, it's like clearly this poor girl has like some PTSD or something you know, that something has happened to her and I'm, you know, anxious to, I mean, I've seen what happens, but I'm anxious to like re-explore it just a little bit and kind of go back and kind of see some more of that. Um, but it had its fun moments at the same time as, as, as the flip side of her being so scared was, you know, you got to see a little bit of the fun part. She was exploring the house uh, with Mike and they're upstairs and he's, you know, like pointing out the TV <laughs> and looking at the pictures and he has her try out that lazy boy recliner and, you know, just look on her face, like, what's this thing going to do, you know? And, and then the ultimate cool part is she has powers. Yes. I mean, you kind of get uh, teased that a little bit in season or episode one where yeah. she stops the fan, but and yeah, in this one you, you see for sure she's got some powers. Yeah, pretty, pretty intense. And obviously they have some sort of effect on her because her nose is bleeding. Um, so obviously it has some sort of side effect um, when she does it. But that was <laughs> super cool. And it seemed like a turning point for those boys because the boys were, were still like all upset, you know, about her being there and this is wrong and we need to do something else. We need to tell an adult or something. And then all of a sudden they're like, 
oh, you're super cool. You have, you have powers. <laughs> we wouldn't have made you mad if we knew you had superpowers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, they're, you know, they're, they're little nerds. So they appreciate, you know, they read comics and they can appreciate superpowers, even if it is a girl. So, um, so yeah, that's just, that's my number four is just, you know, kind of learning a little bit more 11 as we're, you know, get to see, haven't seen much and we still don't know a lot about her, but, you know, just really cool to kind of, you know, learn about her a little bit and see her kind of, you know, open up just a little bit to the boys. So, yeah, I think that's like the whole thing with Mike too, where he, because it's kind of tied into that where he's like, well, what's your name? And he's all like super impressed that she has a tattoo. Mm -hmm. It's like, I mean, it's like the most simplest tattoo ever too. It's just a zero and two ones. He's like, oh, I've never seen a kid with a tattoo before. And she doesn't talk, doesn't talk. And so he's like, oh, that's your name. So it's like, well, we'll call you L for short. And I thought that was kind of a cute moment between the two being like, a, you know, yeah. kind of like the initiation. Like you always give your best friends like a nickname or a good friends nicknames. Yeah. And that's kind of what he's doing there. It's like her initiation into their little group. Good point. Yeah, that was really sweet between them. Yeah, like making her part of the group. Yeah, that's really good. Good. Really good point. Making her feel included. And the part where she was getting pulled by the two guys, like the flashback as she's in the closet. Like she, The only thing I think she yelled was Papa, mm -hmm. which it almost sounded... Um, it almost sounded like somebody from like a different country, like how they would say it, like a, you know, like from somewhere in Europe, like in the 18, you know, 1900s, like that's how they would kind of say Papa. Cause you don't really hear too many people in the States say Papa like that when they're talking to their dad. Yeah. And so I don't know if that's like just a name that maybe this guy's given her. Cause like, like I said, I haven't seen all this series, so I have no clue what their relationship is, but you know, is that like, it's her dad in the sense of like he's created her. Is it a dad in the sense that it's actually her his daughter? Mm -hmm. And so it's like super intrigued, like super interesting kind of situation growing there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see where the rest of this goes. Even though I've seen it, I haven't watched it in a year, so it's it's it feels new ish. So yeah, it's really good. And and the Papa thing definitely seems like because you get a you get a feeling that obviously she's somewhat isolated. Obviously, she has not been in the real world. She has been kept under lock and key for some reason in some type of facility and has not, she's only been exposed to what they've allowed her to be exposed to and whoever these people are. So yeah, I found that Papa thing pretty interesting too. That makes it even more sad. Like you're saying, the only thing she's really been exposed to is like fear really. Cause that's, you know, when he tries, when Mike tries to get her to be like, okay, so you're going to leave and knock on the door and then I'll we'll pretend like this is the first time we see each other. So, cause my mom will know what to do. Like she'll know how to help. Mm -hmm. And she's like, no, like, we can't do that because you know, he's like, well, because why? And she's like, you know, makes the the, sh the sign that, you know, well, if, if we if people find out we're going to die. Yeah. Yeah. That oh, that was that was kind of a an intense, I think, kind of thing. That was like not just I mean, that was like intense. Like, we're not just playing around here. These people, you know, as she's gesturing, you know, making like a gun with her fingers to show, you know, they're going yeah. to shoot me. They're going to shoot you. You know, that clearly there's some real danger here. That was like, a, a I think, a, a intense moment like it was kind of light a little bit before that maybe um yeah yeah I that agree. definitely uh juiced up the intensity i think a little bit definitely for me anyway so that's all i got on number four so my number three um deals with uh the mother joyce buyer so you know when we find her here i think her first part of this episode she's sitting on the 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 table get about ready to get breakfast but she's all worried about getting to the xerox place to get more flyers made she's like you know what we need like 200 300 and she's getting her son to, to go do this as Hopper comes in. And, you know, he looks at the phone that was scorched that we saw in last episode. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and the assumption, of course, is that lightning struck the house and scorched the phone. Mm -hmm. But because right now they need, they need a phone they, because they're, you know, on this search for, for Will. And she goes to her place of work, which we find out. The thing that I find interesting is when she walks in, they're playing Christmas music. So we're kind of given a time frame that this is at least sometime in mid-November or December, you know, around Christmas time, which mm -hmm. is the time of, you know, giving, the time of, you know, helping people, you know, all that kind of stuff. Her boss, as she goes up, she's like, I need a phone. He's like, oh, no problem. Rings the phone up. It'll be like, it'll be twenty two eighty five or whatever the price was. And of course, she's like, hey, I have no money right now because I'm trying to find my son. Like her boss knows that she's, her son's missing. Mm -hmm. and it's just like, hey, you know, I don't have this money. I was hoping I could get a two-week advance. And he's, I mean, it's just like if if you've been working for somebody <laughs> for 10 years around Christmas time, you're like, listen, I'll buy the phone. You don't worry about it. Go find your son. Do what you need to do. Yeah, he seems to be missing that compassion that I mentioned earlier. <laughs> he's a little bit of the uh, the Scrooge in, in this kind of situation. 
Yeah. But as as he, she kind of pries, kind of pries, and he's finally like, okay, I'll get you two weeks notice. You know, you could pay for this phone later. And I don't know how I feel about this, but then she adds in, oh, and a pack of camels. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I mean, I understand this is a really stressful situation, but that kind of felt to me more of like a, oh, I'm going to try and get one more thing while I'm here. Yeah. Um, I actually had that comment in my notes a little bit. Yeah. Um, I thought that was interesting, but you know, she's talking, you know, like you said, she has like no money. It's a very stressful situation. And I'm going to just, at least on that, that comment that she made as a former smoker, I, I no longer smoke. I haven't smoked in like 10 plus years or something, but as a former smoker, I'm just going to say I would definitely be, um, uh, you know, putting them away at that, that point. You know, if I had still been smoking, that's a very stressful moment. Your child is missing. I'm going to take one for the team here for the smokers out there. <laughs> and, <laughs> For anyone that still does it, you shouldn't. Please quit if you can. <laughs> but I'm just saying, I know the feeling, and um, and I totally get that moment. But yeah, I, to- I I do get what you what you mean, where she's just like, you know, okay, yeah, throw in a pack of camels, you know, while you're at it. Um, I think it took out the intensity of that moment, you know, a little bit as she's, you know, trying to stress how important it is. And he does give her a look, like, are you serious? You yeah. know, I'm trying to, you know, help. Which I think he should have donated that phone. I mean, oh no, I completely agree. Like, he's, it feels like if somebody's been working for you for ten years, and it's and like that's like an extreme situation. Like your kid's literally missing, and my phone like blew up. Yeah, it's like listen, this one's on me. Like I will, it's twenty two fifty. I'll take care of it. Yeah, I mean tax write off or something. I don't know how all that stuff works, but you know you would think that like because and then they were talking about like you mentioned earlier, they were talking about um, you know needing money for the Xerox copies of all those missing posters for Will. I don't know. I mean, I have never been in that horrible of a situation. Thank thank you for never, ever having me in this kind of situation where my child was missing. But I thought that I heard, and this could be just something that I heard and totally false, um, but isn't there something like if you're truly in a situation like that, like don't they give you those for free? Like they allow you to make copies in the true like missing child situation that they either donate or you don't have to pay for copies. I, I don't know if that was true in 1983 on this when this was based or not. But I know it was after the Adam Walsh disappearance. Adam Walsh disappearance was like 81 or something, I think. Um, so, I mean, that was kind of a big deal that really brought a spotlight to like missing children and that whole movement. Um, so I don't know if that was a thing back in 83. I was still pretty young in those days, but oh God, I'm talking about my age. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Um, but I don't know. It just seems like, you know, like I said, have some compassion. It's just, it's, it's getting close to Christmas. You know, did she even get an employee discount on the phone? It seems oh, like she yeah, rang it up at full price. Did she get the employee discount? Why didn't he just say, you know what? Yeah, this is pretty bad. Take the phone. All right. It just, it's my donation to the cause to help, you know, help you find your missing son. So. And I don't know what 2250 is in, you know, 1983 money compared to now, but like, I guarantee that's a lot cheaper than the $800 iPhone they're just coming out <laughs> with. So, you know, <laughs> cut, cut her a little break. <laughs> That's hilarious you brought that up. Yep, it is a bit of a discount <laughs> <laughs> with the face recognition. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but the other note, like, I felt like I know I kind of ragged on Winona Ryder a little bit from the first episode because it felt like just felt a little over the top. But at least in the, these couple scenes, it felt more kind of down to earth. And like going back to the cigarette thing, like, you know, maybe at that point, that's, you know, nobody knows how they're going to act in these situations. So maybe that was more of a realistic situation where somebody's going to be like, okay, I got these things. It's like, man, I really need a cigarette right now. And I don't even have the money for that. Just give me a pack of camels too. I need that right now. Yeah. It's it's the one thing that helps you. It doesn't quite do it for you, but it does kind of make you at least have like a false sense of calmness <laughs> in mm. those situations. I've never been through that, but I have been through stressful situations whenever I smoked. It made me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> See, so yeah, that was anyway. my number three is kind of the the situation with situation with Joyce and kind of that uh, interaction with her boss. Yeah, that was really great. I totally agree with everything that you said. My number three, um, kind of short and sweet because we don't know a lot about them yet, but I just, you know, because we're seeing a little bit more, we saw a peek at them, uh, you know, in, in the first episode are the bad men. Um, and that's what like Eleven mm. and Mike were, were referring them to um, in their conversations was the bad men. So, you know, Eleven is warning Mike 
about these bad men that are after her, or at least in, in the way that she knows how to communicate that. Uh, you know, like I said, we saw them a little bit in episode one, how they just ruthlessly killed Benny. I mean, it wasn't even like trying to, you know, like they were, weren't even trying to fake out like, yeah, we're a social worker, we're here to take her, and they just take her and walk away. They just murdered him. You know, that's, and that's your whole like government conspiracy, no witness kind of situation. Exactly, like no loose ends, um, or you know, like Mike would say from Breaking Bad, no half measures. They were. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you saw that show or not, but um, you know, they there were no half measures with these people. They were making sure there were zero witnesses that he was not going to be talking to anybody about anything that he saw or witnessed at all. Um, so they've they've killed Benny in episode one. Rest in peace, Benny. They mm. were listening in on Joyce's calls when she's, you know, talking about Will being missing when she's reporting him. So they've obviously got some sort of access to, to that um, information. They also go to Joyce's house, after, you know, when no one is there and they're poking around and checking stuff out um, because they know that, you know, something's happened there. And so it's like, who are these? Who are these people? It's just, who are they? Are, are they government? Is it some sort of... Um, not black ops. I'm not sure what you call it in the government when there's like that secret program that nobody talks about, you know, it's, you know, the CIA, CIA doesn't even know about it or whatever. Yeah. I think, I, uh, I think they call them like, was it like black zones or something like that? Yeah. Maybe that's it. Yeah. There, um, there's, there's like a name for it, but that's it. Like I said, it's kind of short and sweet. It's my number three. Cause we don't know too much about them, but it just kind of, kind of intrigues me that we're seeing more. And obviously they're involved with 11 and, and whatever's happening with Will, and obviously there's some bad stuff going on in this little town that nobody knows about. Well, yeah, and they raise so many more questions because they have the guy knock on the door. They've got like the fake like uh, electrics or electricity van or whatever as a front, you know, make sure nobody's home. And then, the, you know, the guys jump out in like these uh, hazmat suits and you're like, OK, well, why are these guys in hazmat suits and nobody else is? Mm hmm. And, you know, they go to the, the little shed and they see this goop just dripping. I have no idea what this goop is, but there's some goop dripping. <laughs> and all Papa can give me is extraordinary. Yeah. I'm like, what's extraordinary about it? It's goop. <laughs> Tell me what it is. It's like um, in Ghostbusters, the ectoplasm. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So I'm so I I, I don't want to know what this stuff is. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I totally agree. That was yeah. It's it's um it's icky. It's like snot, isn't it? And that how they refer to it in, in Ghostbusters. That's oh yeah yeah. That's, that's that's my life is movie references. So that's all I'm ever gonna talk about. <laughs> um, but yeah, they. I want to know. I want to know more about these people. I need to. I you know. I don't. I don't feel even as. I don't feel even. You know, with the rest of this. You know, the series. I don't really feel fully satisfied in having that question answered I feel like it gets poked out a little bit and and you get some stuff but um I like all the answers I don't like I don't like vague stuff I want to know everything so well I'm fine as long as as long as it gets tied into to a nice bow at the end and there's no loose ends like if we get through every single episode of this through like the whole series and I still don't know what this goop is (laughs) then I'm going to be upset (laughs) I will have to make something up I will make it my personal mission to uh, find out and explain this goop to you um, <laughs> if it kills me because I want you to be happy and satisfied, Sean. You're going to call the brothers that created the show and be like, okay, I know you guys didn't explain it in the TV series, but what the fuck was that goop? Come on, Duffer Brothers. <laughs> what the hell is the goop? Gotta know the goop. Yeah, I will do it for you. Perfect. I'll use my wiles. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's your number two? So I'm going to go back to my least favorite character steve the guy i have coined steve the d so he gets he gets nancy over to his house for a party you know and um i feel like i was probably you know if i was a girl back in the 80s i would be like barb i would be the girl that tagged along with her best friend and i would be like listen we can't, we shouldn't drink you know, we shouldn't sleep with the boys. You know, we should just go and study. But <laughs> deep down, I want to drink and sleep with the boys. That's what I want to do. Oh, my gosh. And, of yeah. course, just, just like what I would have done, you know, I'm like, okay, listen, I'm going to shotgun a beer, too. I've actually never shotgun a beer in real life. Really? Yeah. I've just realized that right now. That That's okay. I won't judge you for it. I've never done a beer bong, either. Man, I haven't lived. <laughs> <laughs> see, so this is exactly, see, I'm exactly like Barb. <laughs> um, but, That's your new nickname. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, she gets gets him to this party and, you know, Barb's like, you know, is this, like, it's just going to be a big orgy. 
and you know Nancy's like gross and then you know she's taking off her shirt to put on a more sexy shirt like is that a new bra like are you putting a new bra for Steve the D <clears throat> oh let me tell you something Sean she knew exactly <laughs> what she was doing uh yeah she totally knew no girl I mean okay yeah they're we girls do enjoy our, you know, we wear things for ourselves because, you know, we feel pretty, you know, or it makes us feel sexy or something, you know, we'll wear, you know, those fancy, fancy new panties or, you know, <laughs> a new bra or something for ourselves. But let me tell you what, she knew where she was going that night and she knew exactly what she was doing. She wore it because she knew he was going to see it. Mm. Yep. Sorry to break it to you guys. We know. We know yeah, you think you think you're playing us. Oh no, we're one step ahead. <laughs> the girls are the ones playing the guys. I, I'd buy it. Yeah, oh, us guys absolutely. aren't very smart. Absolutely. The guy like as the guy's getting ready for this night, he just picks up underwear and smells it. And is like, yeah, that's clean, and puts that on. <laughs> uh, it amazes me how like women can fall for men because men are just disgusting animals. <laughs> but God bless you, women. That's that's all I gotta say. Well. We got to keep it interesting. So, yeah, she she totally knew what was going on. Yeah, not not a huge fan of Steve myself at the moment, that's for sure. Um, and I'll totally agree with everything you said, but I had to throw in my two cents as well because that was part <laughs> of my notes later on. She knew exactly what was going on. She knew what was going to happen. Um, she might not have known exactly what was going to happen, but she knew what she wanted to happen. So, sorry. We're, yeah. we're always one step ahead. The other note I had is it's so oh crap actually you know you think about it that was a heated pool then because if this is around Christmas time yeah yeah that's pretty impressive see, actually yeah they that that's pretty good I think for I mean it might be because I, I think it's like even what kind of like kind of it I don't have an in in ground pool that's and it's certainly not heated but you know that's kind of an expensive thing now to have done you know and then for like the eighties his dad must have been doing pretty well for himself yeah. you know. Well, He's pretty close to the uh, – because basically the other note I have in here is we kind of got a ducky situation. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you watch any of the uh, – uh, Laura – is it Laura Ringwald or what's her name from all Molly those? Ringwald. Molly Ringwald. Molly Ringwald. Uh, what's her name again? Molly Ringwald. Molly. I was going to say Raleigh. Like who's Raleigh? <laughs> it's kind of that situation where she's got like the guy taking the pictures is kind of like the ducky for her because, you know, they had that interaction at the school mm -hmm. and he's taking these creepy pictures of her because – you know, there's, there's that chemistry between them, but really it's only chemistry for Ducky. Yeah, definitely. That was a little bit of a creeper moment. Um, I get that it, the, the screams and such drew him because he's out there in the in the spooky woods, you know, mm. where Will, uh, you know, his bike was discovered and they know he was out there. And so he's looking around and stuff. But um, and then he hears a scream. So, of course, he goes to investigate because, hey, what if somebody else is in trouble? Like his brother was in trouble and it might help lead him to his brother. So he goes to investigate. I totally get that part. And, you know, he's kind of creeping in the bushes when he hears voices and realizes it's not, like, a bad situation. They're just playing around. But then he sticks around and yeah. keeps, like, taking pictures and looking through the lens and creeping through the window. And it's like, oh, dude, okay. Now you're 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 passing into, like, stalker territory. <laughs> yeah. And they do, go, they do go with the great trope of, you know, oh, he's got to reset his camera right as the action actually happens. Of course. You know, right as, you know, something grabs Barb, um, which... You know, we were talking about some movies and stuff before we jumped on here. And like, I actually kind of jumped in that moment because you kind of you see a little bit of a monster. I don't know what it is, but you see something grab Barb, mm -hmm. and it was a super super intense moment. Very intense, very scary, and very quick. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you if you blinked during that moment, you've you've missed it. So um, I know I had to. I went. I would like kind of circle back to that moment each time just so I could see exactly what was happening. You know, because her fingers dripping with the blood. Uh, you know, and, and it just, it's, you know, they're showing it how it, you know, dissipates out in the water and stuff. And it's like, almost like when a shark picks up blood, is oh, what it reminded call, me of. Yeah. It's like, you know, how sharks can, and I can't remember exactly. It's like, I know it, but I can't think of it because I'm having a total brain fart at the moment. Um, as far as how much distance a shark can be from like a drop, a, drop of blood. It's supposed to like miles. Yeah. Yeah. It's like pretty, it's, it's pretty intense how, how much they can pick up just even a droplet about a blood in like thousands of gallons of ocean water or whatever. Um, but that's what it reminded me of was like her, her blood dripping. And it was like, it called out to whatever this thing is, this creature monster, whatever it is. And, you know, it's like, it was like a call to like a shark with blood in the water. Um, I thought it was really interesting um, and scary and it happened really fast. Mm -hmm. Well, right. I mean, she's like literally, you know what? 
30 feet from everybody else. Like, who knows how far she is from Jonathan? Like, really, really close. Yeah. Um, and yeah. and Nancy and Steve were still standing in the window making out. They weren't even, yeah, they were. like, they weren't even, like, on the bed yet. They were still, like, up in the window. And they, of course, are so engrossed with each other. They don't notice that, like, all the outside lights and the pool lights and stuff went out. Um because it happened so fast and in a flash. But see, if Barb had just been a little bit more slutty. <laughs> she's she, like, hey, Nancy, you know what we fine. can do? Let's, let's liven this party up because I don't want to die. <laughs> exactly. That's, see, oh, shit. You know what? This is the reverse of most horror movies. Exactly. It's usually the slutty people having yeah, sex that are they... murdered and taken out. And see, it's the, it's, it's the Barb's. Are now being taken out. Yep, they're they're saying safety in numbers. Go out and be sluts. That's, that's what it's saying. That's right. Sluts unite. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get Hashtag. that on a t-shirt. <laughs> Go trend it, guys. <laughs> so my number two, just going back to Steve the D and his douchey party. Yep, that's douchey party. <laughs> 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 the next time I have a party, that's what I'm gonna call. <laughs> Oh, gosh. I'm not going to be able to recover from that one. Um, okay, so my number two, you kind of touched on it already when you mentioned uh, the Nightmare on Elm Street, the weirdo on on, this, on that street. I can't remember the name of that street. But um, that, to me, was super fun in this episode, which I think is probably going to be sprinkled throughout more episodes. I think we saw a little bit in the first episode are these fun references that we get to what's kind of current, at least for them in that time, in, you know, in the 80s, which is super fun. Um, I don't know if you picked up on it or not. I'm sure a lot of other people did, or maybe you didn't, and that's okay if you didn't. But uh, how this episode was kind of like E.T. Mm, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you had Eleven, you know, she's hiding in the house without the parents knowing. She's being kept, you know, in a, in a little place or in a closet, you know, hidden away. Mike is like Elliot in E.T., you know, pretending to be home sick to stay home with her and stuff and keep her company and try to talk to her and find out who she is and you know just so she's not lonely in there all day like et was or whatever so i thought that was really cute how um you know it was kind of very similar in that regard and then of course we had like the star wars you know kind of reference mm. uh with with yoda and so that of course made me giddy because i'm a huge star wars nerd um so i thought that was super fun so I just really enjoy seeing like some of these really fun 80s references. They they really have a way of, you know, kind of throwing out some of that nostalgia for some of us, you know, kind of growing up in the area or certain things that, you know, were your favorite movies as a kid, you know, because um, even if you didn't grow up in the 80s, I think most people even nowadays have seen E.T. At least I hope if you haven't seen E.T. people, if you're young enough and don't know what that is, go watch it for crying out loud. Um, it's really good and cute and make yeah, you I think, cry. I think everybody's got at least know what it is. I, I don't... F I feel like I've seen all of it, but whenever it gets to the scene where the government gets involved, I had to mm -hmm. stop watching because even as a kid, that really, really freaked me out for some reason. Yeah. Like, and it's, it's like super sad. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this kind of same similar situation is like, you know, there's a fear that she could get taken away now. And it's not really just taken away. Like, it could be that they could all be killed by these bad people. Mm -hmm. um, the bit that I loved, um, I'm not sure if this ties into E.T. or not because I don't remember the whole movie, but when he, his mom comes home and catches him and she's sitting on the couch and, you know, he's like, oh, you know, I wasn't feeling good, but I'm feeling okay now. And she's like, hey, listen, you know, you, you know, you can tell me anything, you know, I'm here for you, you know, just anything you need. And all of a sudden there's a big bang. Like, you know, I, th I don't remember if she's like, you don't need to lie to me or, you know, you can always tell me the truth. And all of a sudden there's a big bang upstairs. She's like, somebody up there? <laughs> no, yeah. no, nobody's up there. All's good. All's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was another moment. And that was another moment of compassion. I didn't have that on, on my list, but another nice little moment of compassion, little theme throughout the show. Um, yeah, I thought that was really nice. And it was good to see a good parent moment, um, you know, because you were kind of talking about his dad in the previous episode and how he's like, like completely clueless as to what's going oh, yeah. on. And, you know, and that was at least like a, a flip from that type of parent to this type of parent. And it's like, you know, it's cool. I get it, you know. You can tell me anything. I'm here for you. Probably understands that he's, you know, maybe even scared to go to school because Will's missing. You know, mm -hmm. he's really worried about him and stuff. So that was kind of nice. Yeah, Ted would have just been like, wait, you're my kid? Um, <laughs> right. Just go play outside. Exactly. Who are you again? Um, <laughs> yeah. So that that's my number two. Just the fun, fun kind of references um, to that time period that we get sprinkled throughout the episodes. All right. So my number one, I want to go... Uh, with 
I think I think I'm gonna gravitate towards the character of Hopper. Like I just really really enjoy his character so yes. far. And in this, you kind of see it even you know more. So like his his cop mode's gone into effect. Like you find out in this episode that he used to be a big city cop. Mm-hmm. What what that means I don't know, but he was a big city cop, and now he's you know working this small town. Very much like the chief from Jaws, you know, he was in a big city kind of thing, and then he moved to a smaller city because, you know, health reasons and things like that. Like, it's just a little bit more downplayed than big city crime. And in here he's taught, like, he was really shook, shook up by, you know, not only the missing kid, but also the suicide, because him and Benny were friends. Mm-hmm. So I don't know the girl he was with in bed. I don't know if they really said who she is at all. No, I don't think so. Okay. I, did, I didn't think I missed that, but, um, but you know, as he gets up, like, you know, he's with this very attractive lady. I'm sure they've participated in some extracurricular activity because mm-hmm. they both looked wore out. And so he walks outside and she follows and he goes on to say, like, you know, in the last, mi-, like, he's just had this moment with this woman and all he can think about is, you know, his job, basically. He's like, you know, the last time there's a missing kid, like 1923. You know, mm-hmm. the last suicide in this town, 1961. And he goes on to ask, he's like, do you ever feel like you're cursed? Hmm, that's interesting. Now, it's like I watched it, but it's like I didn't make that connection that, yeah, because like what happened to, you know, obviously he's from this area because everybody knows who he is. They all, it sounds like they all grew up together, went to school together, like this group of kids that we're watching now, and they all know each other, but obviously he did move away for a time and like you said, was a big city cop. So it's like, what happened in this big city? to him as a cop and why is he back in Hawkins, Indiana? Yeah, I guess I didn't catch that if he's if he's originally from Hawkins, if well, he's come back. May, I don't know that it's outright said, but to me it just seems implied like mm-hmm. him and Joyce when they're talking during the first episode and you know, it just seems like they have known each other for a really long time, not just that he's the local sheriff. It seems like they all have a history like they all knew Lonnie um, Joyce's ex-husband and the boy, Will and Jonathan's dad. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, it just, and that just might be an assumption of mine. Maybe I'm, I'm wrong. I, like I said, it's been like a year since I've, I've watched this show and I'm rewatching it now. Um, one by one, I'm not binging it. I'm watching it one episode per week. So it's, it's kind of new ish to me, even though I kind of know some of the big stuff that happens, the details I'm fuzzy on. So if that's like played out, I just feel at least that assumption is there that you can probably make that assumption that he, it seems like he's from there. He just seems like he's at home there. Yeah. I think you put those pieces together. It makes sense. Cause like you said, he, she, he knows Joyce's ex-husband. And then there's a comment by one of the other cops is like, um, like what do he say? Like something to the effect of, um, so they've screwed before, right? When he was talking about Joyce and him, like, I guess why he was so concerned. Cause right. uh, the one cop goes on about like how like Joyce was, you know, real close to going over the edge anyway. And Hopper, like, I mean, this is small town cops. Like, they don't know what the fuck they're doing. They're just out mm-hmm. here searching for kids. They have, you know, contemplation and coffee. That's all they do. <laughs> right. And, you know, Hopper's in, like, actual police mode. He's like, show a little class, guys. Come on. And, you know, small town guy talk. You know, the other dude, you know, talks to the other cop. He's like, they've screwed before, right, Joyce? That's why he's so concerned. Right. <clears throat> Yeah, I totally got that too. And and I could be totally wrong. It just it just feels like they've all got a history or they all knew each other from before. And that I could be totally wrong on that. But um but yeah, I I'm I, I totally agree with you. I really I find his character really intriguing. I think David Harbour does a really great job as Hopper. Um and I, I really feel for him and I'm I I find his character really interesting. So I really like seeing him on the screen. Yeah, so my number one's kind of that Hopper uh big city cop in this small town. Yep. I like it. Good. Okay. So my number one is just in general, like so far, like we're learning more. It's the mystery, the mystery in the show. So we have all of these things and all of these elements that we have no clue about. We keep seeing little, little pieces. We get just a little bit more, you know, we're only in the second episode, but I feel like we've, you know, there was a mystery there, but now we're getting little, peeks into you know a little bit more of it we still don't know anything but we're just getting peeks of it like we still don't know where will is you know where is will that's obviously the big mystery going on right now but now 11 has shown up she's part of this mystery as well and just kind of complicating things and confusing things even more you know uh, some because something bigger is going on because she knows will recognizes will 
um, you know, as they're looking at the pictures, as he's showing her pictures of, hey, that you know, that's all of us and our friends, and he's showing trophies, and she sees Will in that picture, and she points him out, and she has this really frightful look on her face, so that just deepens the mystery, and, and you know, like, what the hell is going on, you know, and she, you know, when the, the boys all come together, and she's, and he's like, well, she knows about Will, and they're like, well, what's going on? And she she goes over and she flips over the the D and D board, she holds up that one little figurine of what is it like the little wizard or something from D and D, and says, you know, kind of gestures to it like this is Will, puts in the middle of that board, you know, and, and talks about how like he's hiding, but she's it's like they're kind of drawing it out of her. She's definitely not speaking at that moment, but they're drawing it out of her, and she busts out that little demigorgon figure, mm-hmm. and well, they all I don't know if you out. caught it. That was actually Will's character that he was playing when they were playing D and D. That was it? his okay. piece, yeah. Good. Because I think that's why they kind of like, oh my gosh, that was that's that's Will's piece. And she knew that, obviously. Yeah, that's interesting. No, I hadn't. I don't think I caught that in the first episode that when they were playing that that was his character that he was or little figure, whatever you call them. And I didn't play. I apologize. Um, whenever he was playing, so that's interesting. So you know that I think just deepens the mystery. Like they're they're. It's like you get pieces, but you're not learning anything. You still don't know anything, but you're you're getting almost answers with no answers. Um, mm-hmm. You have those really weird phone calls that Joyce has been getting, like in the first episode, and it burned the phone up. She gets another one, um, and you can kind of this time hear Will's voice kind of come through a little bit. Uh, then the music starts playing in Jonathan's room randomly, uh, blaring throughout the house. The lights are flickering. And then what the hell was that on the side of the wall? You know, oh. she... <laughs> Well, so that's, I've got that written as a note. I mean, so she knows Will, like, she starts to figure out, I think, that Will's in the house somehow, because then the music starts playing as Should I Stay or Should I Go, which feels like it has, yeah, feels like it has some kind of significance. Yeah. And as she's seeing the light, like, flicker, like, she, I think she says his name, it's like, she feels like that's Will trying to communicate, Mm -hmm. but then it goes black. And that's when whatever comes through the wall is like, that's the bad thing. And she did what I think everybody in their right mind would do is get the <laughs> f- out of the house. Yes. <laughs> like you see all these other movies and stuff. People are act like they're brave. No. If something's coming through your wall, you get out of that house. I... Don't stay. Get out. Exactly. But then she goes back in. But I kind of like, so the reason she goes back in is because the music kicks back on and then the lights that like, it was like the safe lights. Right. You know, like that was Will communicating with her. So whatever was bad is gone. At least, at least Will is like back in control or something. At least that's the way I was kind of interpreting it. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. as a mother, it's like, oh, it's like whatever that was is gone for at least the time being. If I get back inside, I can at least communicate with what I think is Will by Morse code via this light bulb. Exactly. Yeah, I, I picked up on that too. I, I'm I'm in agreement and think that that as well. But geez, Louise, that creepy, creepy noise that happens whenever this thing, you know, makes its appearance or, you know, whatever's going on, that is just like the creepiest thing. And then mm-hmm. like the distortion in the wall. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd been running screaming too. And then Barb, we talked a little bit about Barb and, you know, what happened to her, but it, that just, you know, adds to the whole, what the hell is going on? You know, that all of a sudden she's there and then she's gone. Like she's, you know, Nobody disappears that fast. So oh, obviously yeah. something With... kind of very, you know, I don't know if I want to say supernatural, but just something very odd and not right is going on. Well, I mean, usually like something like that's like an attack. Like there's evidence. There's some kind of sign of struggle. But there, there's nothing. Right. Not even like a noise. It's like you didn't even, she didn't have time to scream. Yeah. Love it. So that's that's my number one. It's just the whole mystery that we still don't have answers, which of course, you know, hey, second episode, we're not going to have him, right? Because then what would you do the rest of the show about? Yeah, um, be like, well, I know of... everything. Why exactly. should I keep watching? <laughs> yeah. Just keep showing us 80s stuff. I'd be happy just to keep <laughs> watching, you know, some cute kids in the 80s and stuff. So. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, the mystery is intriguing. I think, I think they're playing it really well. You know, it's like they're giving you enough to keep you intrigued, but not giving, you know, and just, just enough to keep you watching and like question what the hell is going on. So it's my number one. I like it. That's a good number one. Um, so what kind of notes do you have? So we, we kind of covered a lot of them. So we, we talked about the boys' reaction to Eleven in the beginning. You know, they're all freaking out. You know, oh, my God, try to take her clothes off. <laughs> um, and you mentioned Hopper and his character. Something that I thought was really interesting, you know, when she, and you, he comes in in the beginning and she's like, I've been waiting six hours, Hopper. And she she mentions to him at that moment after he looks at the phone after it's been fried. And she's like, well, how would you react if it was your daughter? And you just... 
obviously that's a pain point for him mm -hmm. that totally hit a nerve i thought that was interesting so i thought okay so why why this reaction about your daughter who what happened with your daughter didn't know you had a daughter we don't he certainly doesn't look like a father the way he he's living you know um from the previous episode you know we saw him crash on the couch beer cans everywhere you know so doesn't appear that she's living with him so yeah I, th I think in the first episode when they're searching like uh the teacher asks him about his daughter and he says something about like she lives in the city and then a lady comes up behind him and says oh well she passed away like two years ago or something but like it's all very like hearsay so like you don't know if it's small town talk like maybe she does actually just live with her mom in the city and he doesn't get to see her or maybe hmm. something did happen to her. Or maybe this daughter doesn't even exist. Like, you don't even have a clue. This show has so many strange aspects to it. I don't know what to believe. And I must have totally overlooked that. I mean, crap, I watched the episode twice. How did I miss that? Um, I must have been taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> something, I totally missed that. But I just thought that was interesting. And it looked real. It looked genuine. All these actors are so amazing. Um, and then we talked about him being a big city cop. So that made me think, well, where? Where? What big city? Um, where where was he this cop what happened why is he back in the small town or why is he in the small town if he's not originally from there yeah, I it thought could it be was... in Indiana it could be like you know was it like big big city like Chicago or Indiana or exactly you know, or they talked like... about in, in yeah they talked about Indianapolis like the, their their dad Lonnie was in Indianapolis so that seems somewhat close ish but yeah so what what big city were they talking about will we find out anything uh, we may not I don't know they don't like to tell us everything um thought it was funny as Mike is showing Eleven around the house and he got really excited about having a 22-inch TV. Yeah, and bragging about <laughs> <laughs> It's 10 inches bigger than Mike's. Exactly. And I'm like, isn't that just hilarious that, you know, we, we all have like these huge 55, 60-inch or even bigger TVs and it's like, look what we got by with back in the day and we were perfectly yeah. happy with it. We were happy with 22-inch TVs. <laughs> and yeah, glad to have it. Uh... So I just thought that was really funny. Um, the moment with Joyce in the store. Oh, when they were at the quarry, when they're out there looking for Will, did you notice the quarry that they were at? That mm -mm. quarry was the same quarry that they show, that they filmed at in season one of The Walking Dead. Oh, really? Yeah, Stranger Things films in Atlanta too. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so that quarry, um, yeah, was from season one of The Walking Dead. So fun little fact for the Walking Dead fans out there that might look somewhat familiar, a little bit of a different angle, but looked a little bit familiar. Um, talked about Nancy and her, you know, oh no, I'm perfectly innocent. I'm not going to make out with Steve at all. My new bra <laughs> is all for me. Um, no, we know better. Yep. And then how unstable is Joyce? I mean, so we're seeing her, we haven't seen her quite even because even before she knew Will was missing, she seemed a bit of a hot mess. And yeah. people keep talking about how much of a hot mess that she was even before all of this so is that just how she runs is that like her normal i don't know so and then the music i really like the music the credits uh hazy shade of winter the bangles woohoo um rocking it old school i like that so that was that's all my notes in a nutshell what, what notes do you have let's see so i had the 22 inch note i thought that was very interesting on the tv um one other thing i noticed so i'm not a i was not I was like, I grew up in the 80s in the sense of like I was born like 86. So I, the 80s is a little fuzzy for me. You child. I know. I'm <laughs> such a baby. So, you know, when I was driving a car, when I was, um, you know, into my music phase, I had this big booklet of CDs. And so, like, you tell kids these days, it's like, you know, first off, they're going to be like, what's a CD? <laughs> and two, they're going to be like, oh, I've got this thing that holds like six billion, you know, songs on it. Yep. But on on Jonathan's bed, uh, he's got this like suitcase of cassette tapes, which I don't know if I don't know if, you know, if you ever had anything like that. I don't remember my dad ever have anything like that. But I thought that was like it's like that is the CD case of the 80s. It's a cassette suitcase. Look how far we've come, kids. <laughs> From this huge suitcase of cassette tapes, and w not and before that, it was what a stack of albums and forty fives or um, eight tracks. Yeah, you had yeah, to and carry eight tracks. Oh around. my gosh, eight tracks takes me back. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm I'm gonna plead the fifth on that whole suitcase full of cassettes. <laughs> We're not gonna talk about that. Um, but yeah, it's like this huge. How music was like this huge display or you know how you carry them around to all of a sudden having all of that in your handy dandy little iphone 
Yeah. It's, I mean, and even now, like you don't even have to really have the songs on your phone. You can use Spotify or, you know, one of the other services where you can literally stream any song you want, you know? Yeah. Back during eight tracks, it's like you had to like the whole thing because there was no rewinding. There was no fast forwarding. You know, if Mm-mm. you get the CDs, you can skip. That's amazing. But now it's like you don't even have to listen to the whole song. It's like, oh, three minutes, 40 seconds. I'll listen to two and a half minutes of it and skip to the next one. Yeah. Nobody's got time for a three minute song. No, there was there was no little preview. You know, you get like that 30 second preview on iTunes or something like if you're well, I don't know if I like that song or not. And you just try it out, you know, and you can listen to it like before you buy it or something. There, there's none of that. And let me tell you what, people, for those that don't know and aren't familiar with records or have never played a record, it was a true art, work of art. And, it, you know, to to, to be, be so precise, to move that needle, to skip it to the next song, <laughs> there, that, that took some practice, let me tell you, people, just saying, for anyone that doesn't know. Yeah, good stuff. Good good observations. I, don't, I think I missed the suitcase full of cassettes. That I won't talk See, about. With you talking to move the needle, now I imagine you like running like clubs is like DJ Rima. <laughs> right. <laughs> I need a way cooler name than that. <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna uh, that's gonna be your next job is to find me your your barb from now on. And I need a, <laughs> I need a cool DJ name. <laughs> so work on that. Or write in people if you have ideas. Um give me my DJ name. So that's awesome. Do you have any other notes? Yeah, I've got two more notes. So the other one I have is the uh, the scene with the meatloaf. So um, I despise meatloaf. Like, I, I hate <laughs> meatloaf with a passion. <laughs> and it's just great to see these three kids sitting there, and the, the mom's like, so what's wrong with the meatloaf? And uh, the one boy's like, oh, I'm just, I'm so full. I've, uh, you know, Dustin's like, I've, uh, I ate two bologna sandwiches <laughs> for lunch. I don't know why. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh... It's it's a quick scene, but you see Eleven run down the steps, and the mom's starting to look around, so Dustin just slams his fist on the table. <laughs> it's like, uh, spasms. Yeah. You kids are weird. Yeah, and again, that little sister, uh, Mike's little sister in her high chair, just like makes a noise <laughs> and crunches down into her high chair. Oh my gosh, I'm loving that little girl. I, I Oh, just, yeah. I, I need to watch this little girl every day of my life. Not in a creepy way. That sounded a little creepy. But I'd love to like, see her more, because she's, she's cracking me up. I still feel bad. I, f- I imagine like this act- this girl is the actress. Like she's really concerned. Like all these people are yelling and banging things around. Like she's she's gonna get scarred from this. I I don't think she's acting at all. You oh know, no. She's, you know she looks genuinely concerned and scared. <laughs> if if she's legitimately acting, she needs to get an award this year for sure. No kidding. No kidding. She's great. So my last note. This kind of ties back into so like it feels like the name of this show was based off of, and I just remembered it now when you mentioned. Uh, Nan, uh, Joyce running through the house. Uh, so this was called um, the the weirdo on Maple Street. We tied it back into a nightmare on Elm Street. Just like in a nightmare on Elm Street, Freddy Krueger uh, on top of Nancy came out of the wall, and that's what you got to see here with this this entity coming out of the wall, coming towards Joyce. So I don't know if that's the tie-in. I would I have to feel like that would be it. But yeah, you have that both like the the bad guy coming through the wall trying to come towards our, our heroine. Very good. So Very that's good. that's the last of the notes I have. That's great. Oh, that was great. Good notes. <clears throat> awesome. So that takes us to the news. So a little bit of news that we have for this week. Um, first one is from Entertainment Weekly. So thanks to the Creative Arts Emmys uh, that they had, they had two uh, ceremonies this last weekend. So the Netflix hit Stranger Things has already won five Emmys out of the 18 total nominations. They won Outstanding Casting for a Drama Series, Outstanding um, Original Main Title Theme Music, which I love. I just love that theme. And you see that um, the title of the show coming in. Love it. Um, outstanding sound editing for a series, outstanding main title design, and outstanding single camera picture editing for a drama series. Um, oh, wow. That's yeah, cool. I didn't realize they shot this with a single camera. I know. Isn't that interesting? I think that's why they were so huffy puffy in that one article from last week where they were like, fix your TVs, people, you know, that mm-hmm. whole 4, 4D, 4K, whatever that, that was called. Um, so, yeah. So, fortunately for Stranger Things, um, they're not done winning prizes. They're still... Um, they have five nominations left for Sunday night, including major awards like Supporting Actress for Millie Bobby Brown, who plays Eleven, and Supporting Actor for David Harbour, who plays Hopper. And then um, they're up for Best Drama Series overall. So 
check that out. The Emmys airs this Sunday night, so uh, I'm afraid I'm going to be watching probably Fear of the Walking Dead, but I'll be watching on social media anyway, at least for my, all my updates on who's, who's winning on the Emmys. So anyway, next piece. Do you want to do the next piece, or would you like me to continue? Uh, I can do that. This is the bloody disgusting one, right? Yeah. Okay. So from Bloody Disgusting, so each and every Thursday on the road to season two, Netflix has been releasing fun Stranger Things posters that pay tribute to the films that served as season one inspirations, which those I've seen you post those on face on our Facebook and our uh, Twitter account. And those things mm -hmm. look awesome. Yes. So, so far the art includes have so far the art tributes have included Stand By Me, A Nightmare on Elm Street, Running Man, Alien, and most recently Firestarter. So this latest one is easily the coolest yet, inspired by the iconic original poster for Sam Raimi's The Evil Dead. The image of the young woman being pulled into the ground is one of the most instantly recognizable to horror fans, and the Stranger Thing version sees Joyce Byers being pulled into the Upside Down by the Demogorgon. Yes, why not a writer on an Evil Dead poster parody? Gotta love it. And so like this, this, the article just continues to say that the second season of Stranger Things hits Netflix on October 27th. I cannot wait. And I can't wait to see what other posters, those posters, I just, I love what they're doing and that they're paying a little bit of homage to some of those inspirations that they had for season one. I think that they're, um, I guess you can't really say unique, but um, since they're, you know, kind of referring to others, but I love how they're kind of throwing that in there and sprinkling it in. So um, if you haven't seen all of them, go check them out. They're definitely out there and they're pretty awesome. So yeah, good piece. So this doesn't exactly have a direct news source. This is just something that's kind of happening right now. For anyone that doesn't know um, and you're not already aware, Finn Wolfhard, who plays Mike on Stranger Things, he's currently starring in the new Stephen King adaptation of It. Um, the movie is doing very well right now at the box office. It just came out on Friday. Um, so if you haven't watched it yet, I recommend it. Um, but it's doing really great at the box office. It's breaking records. And young Finn is doing fantastic in that role. Um, he's, he's really great. He's really funny. And um, he, he's as good in it as he is in Stranger Things. And I think he does great in Stranger Things. Um, and he plays a member of the Losers Club. Um, in that movie. So that's just a nice little tie-in and, and kind of another little 80s nostalgia piece, you know, that it is kind of set in if you're not already aware. Um, so yeah, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. If you're a fan of Young Finn, I suggest you check it out. So that wasn't a direct news source. That was something that just I kind of threw out there. So watch it, people. Yeah, it takes place in 89. He plays Richie, who's the trash mouth who swears a lot tells a lot of <laughs> jokes and has a few voices so yeah it was i've seen it twice so far and absolutely loved it yeah it was really good i saw it just the once but um yeah it was really good let's see so this is just from so the stranger things wiki so this chapter contains many nods to et the extraterrestrial with the duffer brothers saying just as et is about the connection between et and elliot this chapter is about connection between 11 and mike just like Elliot pretending to be sick so he could stay home from school with E.T., Mike did the same to stay home with Eleven. At home, Elliot showed E.T. his toys, including figures from Star Wars, like Mike showed Eleven his toys, including Yoda from Star Wars. When Eleven is alone at the Wheeler house, she explores the house in a similar fashion to E.T. Both characters were mesmerized by the TV. The shooting style, music, and cutting pattern of the scene when Eleven sees the picture of Will is closely modeled after a scene from Peter Ware's 1985 film, Witness, when Samuel Lapp points out the evil Lieutenant James McFay to De Detective Captain John Book, which is who? Han Solo, Harrison Ford. Yes. Uh, cultural references. So the Penhurst State School and Hospital. Lucas says Eleven might be an escapee from Penhurst, the nut house in Cur Curley County referencing the real-life psychiatric hospital which closed in 1987. Halloween. So when Lucas says Eleven is probably an escapee and a psycho, Dustin says, like Michael Myers, referencing the killer in John Carpenter's iconic 1978 horror film. Also, there are references to Alcatraz, The Empire Strikes Back, and Godzilla. Love it. Just beautiful how they keep sprinkling all this stuff throughout. Yeah, that's nice. Thanks, yeah, it's fun that the Duffer brothers get to kind of play in their nostalgia toy box and bring all these things that they love out, you know, back into the, the public eye. Yeah, and I don't even know that they're old enough. I feel like they're probably closer to your age, but they seem to have some sort of an attachment or else remember enough of it um, and, and just are in love with, I guess, that whole era. So they, um, they're they certainly at least knowledgeable to, to be bringing all that in, and I love it. 
Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. I just just to kind of see, they're born in 1984, so at most they were six, mm-hmm. um, which I don't remember a ton when I was six. So yeah, they're not much older than me. Yeah, it's but hey, I appreciate their love. Obviously, for that era, they have you know obviously they're gravitated towards it, and and I love it for them. You know, for them bringing it uh, to the screen like they have it. Um, all of us children of the 80s, um, I think are. You know, that's probably a big draw. I mean, it's the story is great. The characters are great. Um, and that's uh, I think that's what keeps us. I think the 80s might b- bring us in, but that's what keeps us there. So absolutely. All right. So next up, letters from the upside down. We have some a little bit of listener feedback. So I'll start this one off. Um, the first one is from Steve Brown. He says, I may be in the minority with this comment. I love watching Winona Ryder's characters dissent. I don't feel like it was over the top. The other characters seem to understand, but not sympathize with what is happening except for Hopper. The interactions between Elle and the boys seem very genuine as well. I do remember thinking that Will's brother is a bit of a creeper, (laughs) even for a photographer. (laughs) Yeah. I agree, Steve. (laughs) Just a little. (laughs) Uh, So we've got an email from Mike Anderson. So started listening to The Walking Dead cast years ago and fell in love. Years later, I found out two more of my favorite things were being joined. Game of Thrones and Jason, LOL. That was my intro to Rima. Had the honor of meeting Jason and Rima at Walker Stalker Boston. And then they were super cool and super down to earth. Then I find out Rima is doing a Stranger Things podcast. Sign me up. Sean and Rima have great chemistry. Love Stranger Things and it comes through over the air. Can't wait for episode two, guys. And Rima, I know I'll see you again in Philly or Atlanta. How do we talk Sean into going? LOL. (laughs) I'm working on it. (laughs) Yeah, I would love, love to go. Um, I see pictures that you guys post. I've seen whenever Jason goes all over. Mm -hmm. And that whole, like, convention is like, you know, you always talk about, like, Comic-Con is, like, the mecca for nerds. Like, those Walker Stalkers is, like, you know, just the the place to be if you love Walking Dead and anything kind of pop culture. It seems like they bring all kinds of other you know, people in that kind of nerdum to the to the stage. Definitely. Yeah. Um, the Walker Stalkers. There's lots of other conventions out there, but we definitely go to a lot of the Walker Stalkers. And of course, that's, you know, Jason, you know, works for Fan Fest and, and goes to, you know, most of the Walker Stalkers. And um, that's definitely like Walking Dead centric. That's why it started. But they've they also have like people from Fear the Walking Dead, you know, that come to some of the conventions. They have started to get uh gosh this last one in boston they had bruce campbell and ted ramey from evil dead and oh my gosh you talk about a moment for me i mean talk about totally starstruck um that was definitely a moment and then of course atlanta is such a mecca for almost all the cast members show up if they can if they don't have other projects going on or if they're not on the show anymore and they have other projects, uh, more of the Evil Dead cast um, people are, or Ash versus Evil Dead, sorry, uh, people are coming. They've got some more people from Lost. So if you liked Lost, you know, I sound like a freaking ad for Walker Stalker. I'll stop <laughs> talking about it. If you don't know what it is, go check it out. I encourage everyone to go. Um, and, and they've even, I know that they've, I think, there's been requests to try and get kids from the Stranger Things. I don't know that, you know, how that works for kids and if they'd ever get them, but that would be super cool if they ever had, you know, because they do film in Atlanta. I don't know if they film during the time that they have the Atlanta event, but man, would that be super cool? Chandler Riggs has been to a couple. I know he's a little bit older now, but he's still a fairly young kid. Yeah, that's true. He has been doing the cons, I think, pretty much um, since, there's, you know, since they've had them. So I guess it's not completely inconceivable that they have and then some of the kids, the child actors from Walking Dead have been there. So I guess that's not too big of a factor. It's probably just availability. These kids are like so popular right now that it's probably just a scheduling issue. Probably more than anything. But how cool would that be? I'd be geeking out over these little kids. A you know, <laughs> grown-ass woman, you know, freaking out over meeting, the, <laughs> meeting these little kids. <laughs> so that's awesome. Thank you, everyone, for listener feedback. Um, if you you know, ever want to write into us, we want to hear exactly what you, what you like, what you don't like. So please don't be shy, you know, post something on Twitter, write into our Facebook, email us. Um, you can even, you know, send us a phone call. Like if you have one of those fancy iPhones, you know, that we were talking about, they have a really cool voice memo app. You can record a message and then email it to us. We can play those on the air. I'd love to hear some more stuff from you guys. So thanks everyone for writing in. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Steve. 
appreciate you guys listening. Yeah, and I just want to say, so the first episode we've released, um, we have been getting awesome feedback on it too. Just like I, more people have been listening to this than I thought we would find. So I just want to thank every single one of you that have taken the time to download and listen to our first episode. And um, like I said, I'm I've even more pumped now to do this show than you know just from the fact that the show is awesome. But people seem to be enjoying our chemistry, Rima. So uh, I'm excited for that. Yeah, we got it. We got it, baby. We got that chemistry. <laughs> that, that Mike was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been a blast. I mean, we're only in episode two so far and I, I'm so loving talking about it with you that just, cause I don't have anyone to talk to about it in real life to really kind of geek out about it. So I really love that you're loving it and that we have an opportunity to talk about it. So the fact that people are listening to us is is truly awesome and that want to hear what we have to say so that's it's a truly humbling kind of fact on our end of things so thank you everyone for your awesome support and keep listening we love you guys and um let us know what you think you know we want to hear hear what you have to say so next week we will be covering the third episode from season one titled chapter three holly jolly so the description for this episode is an increasingly concerned Nancy looks for Barb and finds out that Jonathan's been up and finds out what Jonathan's been up to. Joyce sure. is convinced Will is trying to talk to her. Gonna get good. Vague yeah. as always. Well, at least this like if this was nowadays, she'd be like, he'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, I take pictures. And she'd be like, oh, let me see your phone. Swipe, swipe, swipe. Wait a minute. <laughs> that looks like me. <laughs> Yeah. At least with this, he's like, oh, I can't, I haven't developed those yet, so we can't look at those. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> See, the old fashioned ways saves you a little bit. Um, <laughs> does not so much today do all that swiping. That's awesome. Yeah, I can't wait for the next one and see what happens next. So we are super excited for you to travel to Hawkins, Indiana with us. And until then, you can follow us on Twitter at Strange T Cast. You can like us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash StrangerTCast. You can email us at StrangerThingsCastPod at gmail.com. You can find Strange Indeed and a bunch of other great podcasts like Under the Comic Covers at Podcastica.com. And if you get the chance, go out and please leave a review and subscribe for Strange Indeed or any other Podcastica podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And make sure you go check out Sean in his other podcast, The Language of Bromance, and it comes out every Sunday. It's awesome, guys. Check it out. Yeah, this Sunday we talk about a captain on a ship back in the early 1800s that landed on Hawaii, and they thought he was a sex god. Like, who wouldn't want oh. to hear about that? Uh, well, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, well, that's our show, Episode 2, Chapter 2, The Weirdo on Maple Street. Okay, until next time, I'm Rima. And I'm Sean. And Pake Allen is strange indeed. We never would have upset you if we knew you had superpowers. <laughs> <laughs>